Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Today uh, the lecture is an important one that is because I am going to uh, give you the fundamentals of the ecosystem framework for a supply chain or a service chain and uh, the basis for this lecture uh, is from my book uh, with uh, Dr. Kameshwaran and the picture here shows uh, the ecosystem in other words it shows the, the logistics, it shows the uh, the governments and uh, the environment and so on. So basically this picture was uh, designed to uh, to show that the supply chain or a service chain is affected by the factors that are extraneous to uh, the supply chain. And it's from a book uh, entitled Ecosystem Aware Global Supply Chain Management. It's published this year 2013 uh, by uh, world scientific and uh, the contents of this lecture are the ecosystem uh, and then uh, I will describe the ecosystem and then afterwards the literature on the related subjects. In other words, although the ecosystem concepts is my own, uh, there is literature as always um, from World Bank and other uh, agencies on the related subjects called investment, climate and all that. And I will give two examples of how to map the ecosystem. Uh, and uh, uh, finally, we end this lecture with the use of ecosystem framework in the supply chain analysis. So what is an ecosystem? It is a framework. It is a framework to visualize all operational, strategic, management and execution issues. Why is this important? It is important because as we have seen in the previous lectures, the supply chain is affected by extraneous factors other than the supply chain. It is not just the suppliers, the manufacturers, the logistics providers and the retailers and the customers that affect the supply chain. In the earlier studies, people were talking about supply and demand matching. That was the most important thing. But although even now it is the most important thing, but the supply chain is affected by other factors like the location factors, like the environmental factors, the government rules, regulations and the, the infrastructure that is available and so on. So let us see what is the, <coughs> the ecosystem. It is a, it is a network of companies and countries and their governments, social and political organizations. These are called, uh, 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 this, these are all the, this one and then the natural industrial clusters, financial and human resources, the delivery infrastructure including logistics and IT and also the connections and the knowledge of the industry environment interacting together with the landscape and the climate. In other words, this supply chain ecosystem presents you with like here all the four factors that is the apart from the supply chain and the companies which involve the suppliers, logistics providers, the manufacturers, retailers and distributors and so on. There is the resources that are available for the supply chain that is the human financial and industrial and natural resources they become very important because the human, the labor productivity is very important for the supply chain competitiveness. And similarly, the institutions which are basically the countries, their governments, the social and political organizations, they are also important and they affect the supply chain because the, in a global supply chain, all the, the regulations are set by the uh, the countries and also the social organizations can move against global organization or moving as some particular company coming into the country or and so on. So similarly the industry organizations have to cooperate because they create a brand for uh, the country in which they are coming. 
Similarly, the daily inf delivery infrastructure, which is the logistics, information technology, and so on, and also it's like uh, e delivery. It is like. Uh, home delivery or it is like uh, you know selling through the retailers and so on. So, the supply chain ecosystem consists of all these four factors and uh, that is what we are going to study and given any particular example or an ecosystem or a particular example like auto or, uh, or even a service chain like, like logistics, can you map your supply chain? Can you identify all the resources needed for your auto supply chain and what are the government regulations for your supply chain and what are all the delivery mechanisms that are needed, what is their status in various countries. So, that gives you all the factors that are needed for your this one. So, the four forces in the ecosystem are the supply chain, delivery mechanisms, institutions institutions are the word for the governments as well as the social factors and also the resources which stands for the human financial natural resources and industry clusters and so on. So, let us look at uh, the uh, this one here we have the basic ecosystem which we have seen as the supply chain ecosystem where which consists of the supply chain. The supply chain as you know we have seen it consists starts with uh, it can be a multi tier supply chain starting with uh, the raw materials and ending up with what is delivered to the customer and then we have the resources institutions and delivery mechanisms. And here what is important to study is that these three factors, the resources, the institutions and the delivery mechanisms, these three are known also called as the investment climate. Investment climate of a country or a region can be defined uh, as been defined by uh, the World Bank and there are a lot of studies on various countries concerning their infrastructure. Uh, their in their government regulations and policies and the friendliness of the to the businesses and also the resource availability of various kinds of things. So, this is basically the investment climate, but the one thing I should mention here is that the investment climate as defined by the World Bank is for a country or a region, but here we are talking of the investment climate for a particular vertical. In other words, if I have an auto supply chain here, I am considering the corresponding investment climate, all these three factors for the auto vertical. If I am considering oil and gas, then I am considering the resources that are available and the institution, the regulations for oil and gas and the delivery infrastructure that is needed for oil and gas. As we know, the uh, the this investment climate, these three factors are different for different verticals. So, it becomes very apt that we consider them the investment climate for a vertical in a country rather than an investment climate for a particular country. Now, we have three factors here which are shown down below. One is the co-evolution and second thing is the conflict and third one is the risk propagation. Let us deal with the conflict first. What happens is, in a if you want to a supply chain, an efficient supply chain in a particular country or a region, then as a part of the resources, you have industrial clusters. If you have industrial cluster, friendly industrial clusters, then it becomes it makes the supply chain more efficient. But then to develop industrial clusters, it takes time and it takes capital. But on the other hand, the institutions, the government can make make the environment more friendly by having regulations of free trade. So, the conflict is free trade against developing the particular resources. So, it is the regulation, you want to deal with the regulation which depends on the government and it takes a day to for the government to discuss and give the regulations. On the other hand, it also if you want to create the corresponding resources which is a long term effect and also capital intensive then there is a conflict here and we will deal with the coevolution of innovation and the risk in the next slide. So, let us uh, map this in, a, in more detail.
what you have here in the ecosystem is the supply chain here. The supply chain consists of the suppliers, manufacturers, distributors and retail chains. So this is the map of the supply chain given any vertical, let it be auto, let it be food, let it be electronics, let it be PC, let it be handphone, any, any of these verticals, oil or gas, they have all these four factors. If you want more, more uh, this one you can include as, as necessary. So, and then what are the kinds of resources that are the, the government factors that will say. Now, when you are talking of a global supply chain, you have the issues like customs, then uh, export and other government regulations, export, import and other government regulations. So, these become very important because when you are having trade, this one, and uh, from if you are sourcing your, uh, for, for your manufacturing plant, if you are sourcing the supplies or the components from some suppliers from a country which is different from yours, then in such a case the customs duties and the export and other regulations on both ends of the of the of the chain will become very important. Then the quality control and environmental issues. In other words, the manufacturing it has a lot of GHG gases and a lot of people, a lot of countries are coming up with environmental regulations. And also there is the quality control of the product that you are buying and that becomes very important. And this we sometimes become the country factors. That is where we have included this in our institutions. The quality control factors, for example, if you are talking of a, uh, of a particular product, a pharmaceutical product whether the quality control tells you whether you can use that particular product in that country. And similarly, the environmental regulations, the carbon footprint, they become important and all that. And social, financial and trade issues become very important. Sometimes uh, the social factors like some, uh, you may have labor union problems and sometimes the financial problems because the banks may not give loan to foreign countries and there are also trade issues different issues coming in. And the third one that we are considering is the resources. There is the resources are the infrastructure and the foreign institutional investors and the ports, airports and uh, roads. This becomes uh, uh, an important thing because uh, the, when you are when you are importing or exporting then the ports are important this one and industry clusters. Industry clusters that means if you are having sourcing a particular component if there is a cluster that is available for example there are auto clusters in Pune, auto clusters in Gurgaon, auto clusters in Chennai and these kind of clusters will will help the, the supply chain owners to basically source from these clusters because everything they need is available at one factor at one factor and also there is the clusters also create the the labor uh, knowledge and labor productivity in this and also human financial and natural resources and labor unions are the other resources that are available human resources becomes very important in the supply chain you need the people at various levels in the manufacturing in, in uh, to uh, in the uh, management and also at the mid level in the software and so on. So these human resources come from educational institutions. They can be engineering colleges, they can come from polytechnics, they can come from skill based training institutions, they can come from management training institutions and so on. So the human resource and their productivity become an important thing when in, the, in terms of resources. Similarly the financial resources, the financial resources meaning, meaning the banks, banks are always needed to give loans to the customers. To give, uh, to give letter of credit to the suppliers or manufacturers and so on and also this, the interest rates that charge become an important thing that, uh, that, that in making the resources which are competitive and for the supply chain and similarly the natural resources, the power, water and the mines, all these things affect and also the labor unions and their strength is is an issue. 
and finally we have the delivery infrastructure or delivery mechanisms the logistics and IT companies that are needed the, we have seen in the last class there can be 1 PLs, 2 PLs, then 3 PLs and 4 PLs are also the transportation that is available by rail, airship and, and road and also the logistics parks, the special economic zones, freight corridors and so on. So, if you look at this particular diagram, it gives you a cosmic view of not only your supply chain, but all the factors, all the extraneous factors from the governments from the resources, from while delivering and the, uh, uh, it gives you all the extraneous factors that affect your supply chain. So, it is a kind of an environment that you have. So, while studying this particular uh, subject, there are four things that we study in this that is called grip framework. The first one is governance. Now, you have a supply chain here which is the suppliers are in one country, the manufacturer in another, the distributors are in another and retail chains and customers are in another different country. So, when you have supply chain that is dispersed, then how do you govern this particular thing? The governance should also take into account the resources, the institutions and delivery. In other words, if you are sourcing your supplies from China or from uh, Malaysia or from uh, some other place, then your staff or your management should be aware of all the reg rules, regulations, customs, export and other things and also the quality control, the environmental issues and that because you do not want to be, be a party to any in, in basically uh, uh, going against any of these country regulations. And similarly, you should be aware of what is the logistics providers, what are, who are the logistics companies, what is their delivery mechanism and uh, do they do the perfect delivery or defective delivery and so on. So, the knowledge is needed for about all the supply chain factors. That is the governance. So, the governance is, is a non-trivial issue here when it is globally disturbed. The, the dispersed. You should have connections, you should have the knowledge and uh, also you should have the, the, the management skills and so on. So, there are other things with the risk That's, and I stands for innovation and P stands for performance. Now, let us look at the innovation here. What happened here in this uh, supply chains was first there were modularization of products as I said in the, my first lecture that the whatever product you are manufacturing whether it is a auto, automobile, whether it is a cell phone or a PC or a laptop or whatever it is an assemblage of products. These products are modules and each of these modules are basically standardized and the processes on which these modules are made is also standard. So, that means then you are looking for where to manufacture this particular thing using industrial clusters in low cost countries. So, in other words, the, the products are so standardized, the assemble, uh, the sub assemblies are so standardized, they can be manufactured anywhere. So, if you want to reduce the cost of production and the cost of supply to your customers by the your retail chain at the end, then you want to choose a country where you could do it cheaper. So, the low cost countries, but if you want to do it at the low cost countries, then you need the particular countries where your it is low cost to manufacture and where the expertise is available to manufacture these particular companies, those countries to allow you to manufacture them there either you set up your own shops like the FDI for foreign direct investment or you outsource, but whatever you do then you require permission from the from the, the governments here. So, and then it goes if you want to transport all these components quickly following just in time principles then you require logistics and you also require the the communication companies to communicate globally with your partners. So, that becomes 
a virtual coevolution that is the modularization of products low cost countries manufacture then liberalization of economies and transmitting or transportation of the the components to the to the manufacturers or the supply chain partners in just in time the, so that you keep minimum levels of inventory and reduce the cost so that becomes what is called a coevolution that is what we were talking in the previous slide so the coevolution has been possible because of the the, the all these four things are basically correlated in other words a particular supply chain master he is aware of the resources he is aware of the uh, the country's regulations rules and so on he is aware of what kind of logistics and other facilities that are available so can he can judiciously use those and select the suppliers or the partners and use it to his advantage so that the total cost of production comes down that is the coevolution and similarly you can have what is called the risk problem what is the risk here supposing there is a financial problem in here in one country now the financial country because when you have outsourced this you are using the resources in a particular country and that particular country the financial issues are important because they are either your customers country or they are your suppliers country supposing they are sub, your sub, your customers country like in the united states or the up and so on so supposing when there is a financial crisis there like it happened in 2008 in the united states then what happens is there will be what is called a credit squeeze so the financial crisis here there will be credit squeeze meaning that here the retailers will not be able to sell because the customers will not get loans even if they get the loans they are going to get it they have to pay higher interest so the customers are going to postpone the buying of these items let it be a refrigerator let it be a, a car or let it be a laptop or something they will either repair or use the old equipment rather than buying this that's one thing that gets affected so that means the demand here drops so once the demand drops then across the chain everybody is going to cancel the orders and suppliers get affected and another thing that happens is when there is a financial crisis is if your financial crisis happens in a country where your suppliers are there the banks give what is called letter of credit to that is they stand guarantee for the manufacturer when the manufacturer is getting the products and the supplier is shipping to the manufacturer the supplier needs a guarantee that the manufacturer is going to pay or he has the capacity to pay so the manufacturer's bank gives a guarantee to the supplier bank that's called the letter of credit and the letter of credit can be used by the suppliers to get a loan and so on but the letter of credit when a case of financial crisis becomes very expensive so when the then becomes what happens here is the supplier will not be able to supply to the manufacturer so the supply chain gets affected and also the countries become product uh, uh, protective because when there is a financial crisis and their suppliers are not able to supply to the manufacturers outside they become protective and they want the the country to the country is first rather than the globalization or the trade and once it becomes uh, protective that means the import export and the globalization becomes deglobalized so basically the risk from one part of the chain transmits to the supply chain and in effect either the quality of the product you are supplying goes down or the number of the quantity that you are manufacturing goes down or the cost of your production goes down goes up and so on so there are several ways in which your supply chain gets affected due to factors supposing there is a war in some country and that country is supplying you oil or something 
then the oil becomes expensive. That means the transportation costs become expensive. That means the the logistics of uh, supplying in, in all this B two B B two C logistics becomes expensive, and which means that your cost the the total cost of your product which you are supplying to the customers becomes expensive. So this globalized product uh, the dispersed supply chains one has to be extremely careful both it provides you innovation it provides you co-evolution but it also provides you with the risk and so your governance when you are trying to put this uh, this governance at the uh, this one then you should be able to uh, 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 first discern all the factors that affect your supply chain and you should be able to do the uh, uh, take care of this and, uh, and design an appropriate governance structure. So, this is the virtual collaboration which I already did. Product or process modularization leads to outsourcing and the low cost countries liberalize the economies and reduce the tariffs. The internet enables secure man machine and machine uh, machine machine communication and ports hard, uh, hard and soft infrastructure logistics infrastructure gets developed and finally contract manufacturers third party logistics providers consultants software companies have sprung up and it is till 2008 it is up and up and up and so on and everybody is so happy and similarly you can global supply chains have proliferated. Similarly, you can talk of the risk amplification and transmission. So, connectedness transmits risks across the verticals, countries and finally towards leads to trade collapse as we have seen in the last class. Home loan crisis resulted in credit squeeze and rise of interest rates and credit squeeze lead to drop in the demand of products, cancellation of orders to suppliers, closing down of plants in the low cost countries loss of demand for the logistics players and countries turn protectionist and this leads to trade collapse slowing down of global globalization as well as GDP unemployment and so on. So, people are saying that you know there are a lot of articles uh, in recent uh, 2009, 10, 11 which show which blame the global supply chains and their risk amplification and transmission through connectedness to the global trade collapse. So, if you want to see what is that that has happened here in this global supply chain networks here, you have a supply chain and all the four actors that uh, the ecosystem factors and in olden days the products um, they were produced, uh, they were integrated and they were locally produced. And in terms of resources, they were all vertically integrated and localized enterprises. So, you are using local resources. If you are in India, then you are Indian manufacturing, you are using local resources. You are not getting anything from anywhere. And uh, so, there is this uh, local manufacturers and controlled export. That was the uh, uh, thing that about you know world trade has not grown in earlier days. So, that is the institutional this one and you have delivery mechanisms which are paper communications and truck and truck transport and service local markets that is the delivery mechanisms that people are used to. So, what this circle above shows is what was prevalent in the 60s and 70s, but now you have a global supply chain network. Now, what does the global supply chain network mean? What the products which are integrated and they were produced locally, it have become modular and global production networks. So, there is a transition from local production to modular uh, global production network and similarly vertically integrated to globally distributed networks, there is a transition in terms of the resources, which means instead of using your own resources earlier, you are and producing resources by yourself, 
by having polytechnics and so on for labor, for having banks and giving the loans for finance and so on. You have now globally distributed networks. That means you have to get finance from global companies, wherever whichever country you are there, you have to get human resources from the country which where you are sourcing and so on. So basically all the resources become globally distributed network. And similarly, the the uh, institutions have to deal with free trade enabled global markets from local markets and they were only exporting to free trade enabled global markets. And similarly, the delivery infrastructure has moved from paper communications and truck transport serving local markets to internet enabled third party logistics providers serving local markets. So, you can see that the global supply chain has made into these four factors and that is how the evolution that we have described has happened and our uh, ecosystem aptly describes all the factors that are involved in this. So, before we proceed further, we we'll, let us look at the literature. This. The literature is what are the drivers for global uh, supply chain competitiveness. There, there are literature by a lot of consulting companies, McKinsey, Deloitte and others who talk about various factors, but not in these four items that we have mentioned. In other words, the World Bank talks about the investment climate and the Deloitte and other manufacturing competitiveness reports, they talk about various factors. They give list about 10, 15 factors. But in our, the advantage with our this one is they are all basically grouped into three factors. And the fourth one is the supply chain. But the supply chain is affected by three factors. And they are the resources, the institutions and the delivery mechanisms. The advantage of these three factors is the following that you know where the decision making is, is who is responsible for the decision making and which are the institutions that are making decisions. In other words, if you are looking at financial problems, you know banks are responsible for that. So, if you are looking at human responsible, this one, human resource productivity, then you know the skill training as well as the educational institutions are responsible for it. If you are looking at uh, say regulations, trade and all that, you know they are government departments. If you are looking at the problems with your logistics, with your delivery, with your ports and so on, then you know they are the ports responsible. So, by grouping all the factor, facts under three words, you know who is responsible for it and now you know how to correct for those things. So, the resources, labor, material and energy and the government policies, investments, institutional, environmental and infrastructure elements, which is economic trade and tax systems, the legal and regulatory systems, investment in manufacturing and so on and the delivery mechanisms. So, we have basically all the factors that affect the supply chain competitiveness. Of course, apart from the supply chain itself are given this particular uh, this one. I mean, there are lots of reports without mentioning these three top items. All these things are listed as 10 to 15 or whatever and I have added my own here in this and there are lots of reports from consulting companies. Similarly, there is a comparison with global entities by World Economic Forum. World Economic Forum uh, apart from the World Bank on the investment climate has these reports on global competitiveness report. That is the rankings depend on elements of microeconomic environment, the quality of public institutions and the level of technological readiness and innovation. Of course, this global competitiveness report does not include all the factors that we have included, but it includes only some, but still you know it ranks countries by these elements. And there is the global information technology report, 
which is the network readiness index is a measure of the degree of preparation of a nation to participate in and benefit from ICT developments. It deals only with the information technology which is a part of delivery infrastructure. It does not de deal with the institutions as well as the resources. And the investment climate which is a World Bank reports, it is has three factors, the microeconomic factors, the regulatory framework and physical and financial infrastructure, power, transport, telecommunications, banking and finance. So, these are all empirical and data driven in the sense these institutions they uh, which are making the report, they collect lot of data and analyze it, they are excellent reports. But our eco uh, the ecosystem framework is much more general than what these people are talking about. So, if you take uh, our, uh, our framework, it is possible to gain more uh, knowledge, more knowledge and then also give more, info, in more in informed decisions using the ecosystem framework. So, before we proceed, let us see how, how to map the ecosystem for some examples. Let us take an auto example in the auto system, if you take uh, there is the auto supply chain that is the, you have the design and then the clusters and suppliers, manufacturers, dealers and customers. So, basically that is the auto supply chain uh, base, uh, that, that one has. Uh, Let us really look at what are the kinds of uh, the government regulations come in and so on. The government regulations are there are a lot of government regulations come in the free trade agreements. For example, India has free trade agreements in the auto with some countries. There is the ACMA that is Auto Components Manufacturers Association and also CII which is the Confederation of uh, Indian Industries. These are the organizations that basically help in training as well as in making in helping the government in making policies and so on. So, this is the government regulations. I am talking of uh, the Indian uh, this one, but in every country they have automobile associations, their industry associations and so on. They are quality control and social and environmental issues. Now, the transport which is the auto system produces vehicles and vehicles produce lot of greenhouse gases and they use, uh, they use uh, petrol and an oil. So, that becomes you know there are a lot of gas generation and there are environmental issues that are connected with this. And also there is the quality control depending on the particular type of roads that you have, you have a quality control of the vehicles. And also there are the foreign direct investment policies for entry of the foreign companies. In any country, you know outsiders cannot come and establish this without the permission of the country. So, the FDI policies for example, in India there are the companies can come and establish here and there are rules and regulations associated with that. So, there for example, there, there are Toyota, there is Hyundai, there is the GM and so on all these auto companies have established their presence in the Indian subcontinent. So, basically you can see that in the auto supply chain for a particular company how these institution factors help in establishing their companies, their establishing their presence and also in terms of uh, the quality control and environmental factors. So, what are the resources that are needed? The auto clusters, the special economic zones and product development labs because the auto requires a lot of uh, uh, research and product development labs become very important. And auto clusters for example, in India we have clusters in, in the south in Chennai and uh, in Pune in the west and in the north in Gurgaon and near Delhi. And so, the auto clusters that is where all the auto manufacturers they basically try to place themselves near the auto clusters. And the universities and R and D low carbon and electrical vehicles because there are a lot of things happening in the auto industry. That is because to reduce to make the 
uh, the auto industry environmentally sound, people are going into gas driven autos, electrical vehicles and so on. So, there is lot of impact on the manufacture of these vehicles and financial and insurance companies and labor unions. Now, auto industry, the industry of all industries. So, in 1913, Henry Ford started uh, the assembly line which has made the first auto, uh, the automobile as we know it today. And so, and also there is the insurance companies that are involved because of the accidents and other kinds of things and the labor unions are involved in the auto this one and there is a lot of financial assistance that is needed from the banks uh, particularly for giving the loans auto uh, automobiles are very expensive for a person to buy so there has most people take loans and that's where the financial uh, resources are needed and finally, the delivery infrastructure where the GPS providers, advertising companies and product recall companies. In other words, in the auto for some reason or the other, if there is a brake failure, if there is something else, then the, the, all the products need to be recalled. So, you need to have some reverse logistics on this. You need infrastructure on petrol and gas stations and also dealers, spare parts and repair shops. You know, the dealer spare parts and repair becomes very, very important for an auto supply. If you are a company, you want to sell your, your car to the customers, then you better make sure that the repair shops are available and all the spare parts are available, the company's spare parts are available at reasonable rates. So, you can see that we were able to map for an auto supply chain the ecosystem. Now, you can see all these factors become very important. If you want to make your auto supply chain, it is not just producing, getting components, producing a car and so on. So, there are other factors that are needed. There are banks that are needed to give the loans, there are repair shops that are needed and the governments have to permit you and the petrol and gas has to be cheap and it has to produce less emissions. And, and also, if you want ultimately your product to be cheap, your auto clusters, you have to be present in auto clusters where you can get or in special economic zones where you get lot of SOPs. So, you can see that this will give you the cosmic view of auto supply chain. Let us uh, map another one uh, which is a service chain that is the inbound logistics ecosystem. That is inbound logistics is the logistics that is in transfer of materials from a supplier to a manufacturer. Now, in other words, against an order, the supplier has supplies to a particular manufacturer required quantities. Now, this is important because the manufacturer product uh, production depends on the supplier's reliability to produce this. If you want to start your production at 9 o'clock in the morning, then there should be assurance that the, all the components that are available, that are needed for the assembly of the automobile or any particular component, but this one or, or on the road or near the, near the factory or in the warehouse. So, what is the, uh, the vertical based inbound logistics chain? So, you have suppliers for this one and it ultimately go to a manufacturer or a supply chain, but in between you have warehousing and transporting and also customs and transportation. So, in other words, at the both ends you have the suppliers here and the suppliers they have a warehouse where they will store all their inventory and there is the transportation that is, takes it. and. If it has to cross customs, if it is crossing the countries, it has to go through the customs and then transport it to the manufacturer's warehouse or a supply hub. We have seen what is a supply hub in this. So, this is very briefly the service chain that is associated with the logistics. Now, here what are all the, the institutions coming in? Because you are crossing the countries, then the customs, export and other government regulations that you need to quality control, social environmental supplies and you have world trade organization, free trade agreements and trade facilitation that affect the time that is taken for your 
uh, at the port for customs clearance. So, all these affect the institution rules and regulations affect and also uh, affect your uh, the transit time at the port. And what are the resources? Of course, the infrastructure, the ports, airports and roads and the universities, R&D and skill training, financial insurance companies and labor unions. These are the same for the as in the auto uh, this one because uh, the uh, same kind of logistics here. So, you have logistics companies and IT companies that are involved and the transport, uh, the rail, air, ship and road transport and logistics parks, SHIs and freight this one. So, you can easily see the map although you are sup from suppliers to your transporting end to end in this and this particular thing is vertical based that is if it is auto this is uh, different I mean these are all general labels but this vertical these are all these things are vertical based auto gas or electronic and so on. So, we are able to map this for a service chain this. So, given an example if you are working for an industry you can map your own supply chain and see the effect of whatever the bad infrastructure on your supply chain, the non availability of financial uh, loans on your supply chain, the labor productivity on your supply chain and so on. So, under the government regulations on your supply chain you could easily affect this. So, these two examples will give you some kind of an expertise in mapping the, the supply chain. So, this as I said before the supply chain ecosystem framework can help you study governance which means how do you govern your globally dispersed supply chain. You can evaluate the risk and the risk comes from all the four factors. It can come from your supply chain of course that a lot of people know how to study. It can come from resources like the financial resources or it can come from the human resources or it can also come from the governments by just saying that uh, they are turning protectionist or it can also come from your delivery infrastructure, delivery infrastructure, labor strikes, port strikes or it can be the, the truck failures or it can be several other things or piracy during in the uh, in, in, in the in the seas and so on. So, similarly innovations can come from the governments, it can come from the resources, it can come from of course your supply chain and also in the delivery infrastructure. Your performance that is your lead time, cost and other factors they also depend on the four factors. For example, if you are talking of a lead time people usually talk about the lead time for the supplier, so supply chain, but if you are crossing the countries then the delays in your uh, uh, in the in the port or the delay in uh, in your delivery is going to affect your lead times, the total lead times which are end to end. So it we will we are going to consider all these four factors in future future lectures. But suffice it to say that now, as far as now, this framework can help you study all these four factors. Therefore, another thing that is from a uh, strategic perspective. This particular perspective gives you there are five factors. People, these five STEM forces. S stands for science. Scientific research generates new and improved products. There is new technologies, internet and search emerge at a rapid pace, and new engineering materials and design come out every day. And but the, we are now introducing one thing: globalization brings new challenges following of regulations and policies of the several countries, the intermediate products visits, regulations such as climate change require attention. And finally, you have new management techniques and business models such as outsourcing, sell direct, supply hubs are invented to face competition and enable growth. So, what this particular uh, SES framework gives us is that there are five forces that are needed and usually people talk about STEM framework, science, technology, engineering and mathematics. But what we are saying here in, in terms of global supply chains, you have two more that are needed. 
which are regulations and policies and the management, new management techniques. In this. And when you are talking of this term framework, what type of policies and programs to create, what tax reforms are needed or what general education policies and programs to introduce so that companies in a vertical can become highly competitive and in the global scenario. So, in other words, this is a reverse question here. If you want supply chain competitiveness, people usually talk about cost cutting within the supply chain or uh, doing something else or lead time, just in time and so on. But here there are other factors like what are the policies and programs to create, your country can create and you can create tax reforms are needed and the general education policies to introduce so that the vertical become highly competitive and so on. So, the, the other three factors become or can also help in making your supply chain competitive. So, what are the conclusions that we have here? Conclusions are that uh, we, we presented the ecosystem framework. That is, there are four factors, the supply chain of course and the resources the supply chain uses and the institutions, the governments, the supply chain visits and the social uh, institutions within those countries and also the delivery mechanisms the supply chain uses. They are also become very important. And we have also shown how to map the ecosystem for auto and inbound logistics verticals. Well, you could do it for food supply chain, you could do it for uh, a telecom uh, supply chain and other things and that will give you how, uh, how these things, the other factors affect this and it will give you a cosmic view of things. So, one exercise that you could do is if you whatever vertical that uh, you are interested in, then you can just map this uh, the uh, the ecosystem and then see what it gives you in terms of the knowledge. And if I put the ecosystem in perspective of current literature on the investment climate, we said our ecosystem is, is the, the, the there is the World Bank investment climate which is our ecosystem is more particular to this particular supply chain than the investment climate and also there are several reports uh, by consulting companies uh, like Deloitte, McKinsey and others and our report basically puts, uh, uh, puts all the uh, factors that affect the supply chain into three big factors and the advantage of having three big labels institutions, resources and delivery is we know where the decision making power is there. So, if you want to affect the financial the problem, then you know where it is, it is in the resources. So, if you want to affect the supply chain, you have to get into the banks. If you want to affect the transportation problems in the delivery mechanism, you know where to and how to how to do this. If there is any problem with the regulations, then you know where it is and you have to go to approach the government, the decision making powers. So, we have outlined the STEM framework and also the GRIP framework here. So, what we are going to do in the next uh, uh, few classes is the next three classes we are going to go into the each of these frameworks in detail. For example, we will go to the global supply chains and afterwards the delivery mechanisms and afterwards the institutions and the resources in greater detail and expand that. And then we are going to look at uh, some of the uh, applications that we could do and finally, the GRIP framework with examples. So, Thank you and then we will talk about global supply chains in the ecosystem framework next the next class. Thanks.